guys may be seated. Good morning. Well, the Newark Naz. We're glad that you joined us. If you're online, we say good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. If this is your first or second Sunday with us, we're very grateful that you have come. And we invite you to fill out a connection card found inside your worship folder. You can put it in the offering basket or drop it off at the information table after the service. Also, just a quick reminder, uh, remember to save the date for the Art of Marriage Conference coming up February 7th and 8th, and uh, I believe today you can uh, sign up. There's a table in the lobby. Uh, if you want to sign up today, that would be awesome. Check out the details in your worship folder, which uh, brings up the next announcement, and that is there are lots of things happening in the life of our church. We want to make sure that you guys get all the information and all the juicy details so make sure you use, read your worship folder, and you can also visit us online at newarknaz.org. As we experience the love of Christ this morning and his presence during our worship time, here's a question that I want you to think about. What thing or things bring contentment to your life? How many times have you heard someone say If I had his money I could do things my way But little they know That it's so hard to find One rich man in ten the satisfied mind The wealthiest person Is a pauper at times Compared to the man With a satisfied mind When life has ended Time has run out My friends and my loved ones I leave, there's no doubt But there's one thing for certain When it comes my time I'll leave Satisfied mind. Let's stand together. I'm fearless He shares a melody And tells me to repeat it And it makes me whole It reminds my soul I am all
times our lives are inspired when we hear the story of someone and, and the way God's been working in their lives. And so I have a testimony that I'm going to read that was written by a lady named Joan. And it's her story of different things that she's gone through in her life and how she found peace and contentment um, regardless of what was happening to her. So, <clears throat> Growing up, life seemed to go pretty smoothly. There were the usual ups and downs, but nothing very serious. I got the first summer job I applied for. I had my choice of universities to go to, and I even got accepted for a summer dietetic internship against pretty steep odds. And while some things like finding a husband and having children took me longer than I planned, eventually I got most everything that was really important to me. That is, until my husband and I made plans to go overseas to do relief work, everything seemed to fall into place perfectly. All our bags were packed and ready to go. When we got a phone call informing us that they no longer felt that we were suitable for the assignment. No matter how hard we tried to reverse the decision, the door stayed closed. It was the greatest disappointment I had ever experienced. In the past, everything had eventually worked out, but this time, it didn't. About three years later, my husband's older brother told us that he was dying of AIDS. Again, it was so final. Nothing we could do could change the diagnosis. The next 18 months were very difficult ones for our whole family. It was hard to let go of a brother-in-law that we all loved and who was so gifted. The anguish was so great that my father-in-law never did recover from the hurt. Four months after his son's death, he died of a stroke. And although my brother-in-law's death was difficult, dad's was even harder. We had been very close, and he was an incredibly wonderful grandfather to our three girls. The next major blow in my life was when I miscarried our fourth child. This baby was to have completed our family. Having had three healthy children, the thought of losing this baby had never crossed my mind. So when I miscarried at the end of my first trimester, I was devastated. We all struggled with the disappointment of losing this precious little child. I cried for weeks, even after I discovered I was pregnant again. As I reflect back on these events, I sometimes feel sad, but I don't feel angry or bitter. In fact, there's a real sense of peace and contentment. I attribute that to the relationship I have with God that began when I was a child. I remember praying in a simple prayer at church, asking Jesus to forgive my sins and to come into my life and make me the kind of person that he wanted me to be. And he did, just as he promised he would. As I look back over the difficult circumstances of my life, I can see God's hand in each one. No matter how out of control it felt at the time, it became evident that God was in control. At the time, we were very disappointed that we couldn't go overseas. But now we know that if we had gone, we wouldn't have been there through my brother-in-law's illness, and our girls wouldn't have ever known their grandfather. And even though my brother-in-law's death seemed like such a waste, it was through his terrible illness that he committed his life to Christ. There's such a peace and a joy knowing that, that he is in heaven with the Lord, and someday we'll see him and dad again. And my miscarriage, while we all struggled with the loss of our little one, we have that wonderful hope that someday we'll get to see him and hold him again. Over the years, I've found that if I focus on my problems, I can get just as frustrated as anyone else. But when I keep my focus on God and allow Him to direct my life, then I can experience His peace and contentment in the midst of crisis experiences, as well as in the day-to-day -day challenges of being a wife and mother. I found my peace and contentment through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. And God, we need you. And our heart cries out for you, Lord, how we need you. Lord, when we let you in, we find out that you're everything that we need, that you are enough. And so, Father, I just pray for your spirit. Continue to minister to our hearts. Lord, I know there are people whose hearts are breaking today are facing big things, but you are a big God, bigger than our circumstances, Lord. And so we hang on to you, 
to say that we trust you, Lord. Give us strength. Give us peace. Give us your love and mercy, God. Amen. As we continue to worship right now, ask the ushers to come forward. We're going to give our tithes and offerings and sing this wonderful hymn.
Jesus, we are so thankful for that song and the anthem that it is. We thank you for the cross and the promise that our sin, not in part but in whole, is nailed to the cross. Lord, we do haste the day that our faith will become sight and we can worship you face to face. We're thankful for the promises that you have in our life. Lord, I pray in these next few minutes that we can hear from you. I pray that it's not my words that we hear, but rather a voice, rather we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking and directing our lives. We love you, and we give you the praise. Amen. Well, good morning, afternoon now, I guess. Uh, my name is Eric Clark. For those that may not know me, I am the student community pastor here at Newark Naz, and I get the privilege of leading and pointing students to Jesus. We do a lot of things within student community to make those things happen, but bottom line, we want our students to have a growing relationship with him. We model within student community the mission statement of this church, and that is to have our students having a growing relationship with him. And before I continue further, I just want to pause just for a second and say that I know third service, Wes sometimes gives you guys a hard time for taking your time and getting here to church at 11.30. I just want you to know, if I wasn't on staff, this would be the service I would come to. There's no point in getting up early, take your time, right? So just throwing that out there, I know sometimes he gives third service a bad rap, and I just wanted to affirm that there are some on staff that appreciate uh, third service time. Anyway, so I've worked with students for quite a few years now. And while the gap between my age and the age of the students that we work with steadily increases year after year, haven't figured out how to make that stop yet, uh, I love the change that takes place uh, from a seventh grader uh, all the way to a senior in high school and even graduating beyond that. Uh, I've been doing this long enough now that I have students that had in junior high that are now married with kids. I've been in their wedding uh, it's, it's an awesome privilege to walk alongside of those people. And, and the goal is that hopefully they are more mature now as adults than they were when we had them in junior high, but um, that doesn't always translate. But anyway, um, I think we all can agree that junior high and senior high can be an awkward time in life. Amen? Right? And so I asked the staff if they would play along with us this morning. And if they would allow us to walk down memory lane together. I asked each of the staff if they would submit a picture from their junior high days or senior high, and most of the staff complied. They were gracious enough. There were some that claimed they couldn't find a picture. Um, I wonder if they just didn't want to find a picture, but I'll take their word for it. So very quickly, we're going to scroll through these. Uh, Here's Pastor Jen, our children's pastor there on the right, 80s at its best. Oh, I did promise that I wouldn't uh, make fun of the pictures, so we just have to move quickly here. So this is Tevis Austin. He's our family ministry pastor and uh, the campus pastor of the firehouse. Just a note, that is not his wife. That was a junior high dance of some sort. Tim Powell, which is our real-life campus pastor. Don Gessner, which is our executive pastor, now the worship leader at the uh, encounter service on Saturday night. Cheryl Simpson, who we all know and love, and I think it's very fitting that Cheryl has a crown because she is so uh, sweet. That was apparently a junior high uh, homecoming or something, something along with this. Debbie Murky, which is our administrative assistant, and for those that know Debbie, like, she looks just the same. Like, it's not fair that some of us had these awkward pictures, but uh, uh, speaking of awkward, here's Brian Redman. Can't make any comments. Moving right along. Our, our lead pastor, Wes Hummel. This is so funny. Every service, I kid you not, Brian gets laughed at and Wes gets in awe. I don't, I don't know what it is, but that's been every and, and, of course, I wouldn't ask uh, the staff to do this if I wasn't willing to humiliate myself. So there's a picture of me in junior high. You know, for me, uh, the five years of braces and the two years prior to that of dental work, it was horrible. I am, uh, and the constant acne uh, I'm glad that subsided, and uh, voice squeaks, you guys remember those? Those were fun, you're talking and all of a sudden you sound like Mickey Mouse for a few minutes, uh, for a few seconds. Uh, vivid memories of answering the home phone when I was younger, and, and uh, my mom's name is Chris, and the person on the line would say, Chris, it's so good to hear from you. No, no, I'm not Chris. <laughs> Nothing more humiliating for a guy to be mistaken for his mom, and so... 
quick side note, uh, you really have to embrace the whole made in God's image concept when you, you look like that and you go through that. Uh, I was 65 pounds in junior high, and so uh, I was a small guy and uh, very thankful that those days are behind me. Uh, and while we all agree that we have changed, for those that are now in adulthood, that we've changed from our days and as teenagers, it's interesting that we still carry some mentalities that we had back then into adulthood. One of the biggest struggles that, uh, that I see and uh, the, the team that we have with the student community sees is this idea or a concept for our students of comparing themselves to others. For example, I will hear guys say, if I could just be as strong as they are, then I would be happy and I could be on the team and I would have, uh, my life would be so much better. Or girls, sometimes you'll hear them say, I would do anything in my power if I could just be as pretty as they are. Or everything would be great if I could just be as popular as that group over there. And for me, uh, in, our, in my high school, we had these benches that were in the foyer, in the common area, and, and before school, during lunch, and sometimes in between uh, classes, the popular kids. It was just reserved. These benches were reserved for the popular kids, and they would sit there. And I always had this desire that I just wanted to sit on these benches. And uh, I wasn't a part of that group. You saw the picture. And so uh, I wasn't a part of that group. They were gracious enough to let us sit at their feet and just look up and, and marvel at their greatness. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> but as adults, I realize that comparing looks different. It feels different. So see if you can relate with any of these. as uh, It's basically the same concept as you're comparing. All my problems would go away if I just made as much money as they do. Or it sure would be nice to live in that house or drive that car. This one's a little negative, but you're still comparing. At least my kid doesn't behave like theirs. Sometimes wonder if um, you might say that about me, but it is what it is, I guess. I love my kids. They're actually sitting right over here. Sure, sure would be nice to have less wrinkles. If I could just get that next promotion, I would be happy. And this one might just be for me, but must Nice, must be nice not to be bald in your early 30s. <laughs> but in Philippians, the writer Paul, through the Holy Spirit, wrote these words, and you can see them on the screen with me. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I have a question for all of us this morning, and it's, it's a question that, that I don't hear in everyday conversation. Maybe in the conversations you have, it is normal. But this question uh, is something I feel like it's very important for us Christ followers to ask, and it's how content are you in your life? If you were to think of all the different hats or all the things that you do that make up who it is that you are, and you ask that question, how content are you? Another way that it can be asked is, how at peace or satisfied are you in life? William Barclay has this quote. I just thought it was phenomenal. I want to share with you this morning. It says, contentment is one of the most difficult Christian virtues to attain. Yet it remains one of the most crucial virtues. A contented Christian is the one who best knows God's sovereignty and rest in it. A contented Christian trusts God. They are pure in heart and is the one most willing to be used of God, however God sees fit. We live in a world that breeds discontentment. We're bombarded with the message that in order to be happy, we need more things. We need less wrinkles. We need better vacations, and we should have fewer problems. End quote. I think that statement is so true. It's so easy for us to follow it, fall into this idea of being discontent, of wanting more. I know it certainly is true at times in my life. Obvious statement here, but we just came through the Christmas season. And part of the Christmas story uh, where we're focusing in on Christ, Christ's birth, is the birth of John the Baptist. John the Baptist's mother was Elizabeth, who was a relative of Mary, which was the mother of Jesus. And John's sole purpose in life was simply to prepare the way for the Messiah, for Jesus. 
And as John began his ministry, he continually and constantly had to remind people that he was not the Messiah. You see, from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New, there was about 400 years in between those pages. A lot of things had changed, and there wasn't a prophet. There wasn't a spokesman on the behalf of God. And so when John showed up, people were finally, they they were like, finally, uh, the Messiah has come. He's come to rescue us. He's come to redeem us. And so John and his disciples would go out, and and these large crowds of people would follow and and claim that he was the Messiah. And, And John would have to remind them, I'm not the one you claim that I am. In the Gospel of John, we read an account where Jesus' ministry had started, and the crowds that were once following John were now following Jesus and his disciples, and the disciples of John were not okay with this idea. They enjoyed being in the spotlight. John knew it was going to happen, and so he was okay with it, but we read this account in John 3. It says, John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River... The one you identified as the Messiah is also baptizing people. And everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. I can sort of picture uh, them pouting a little bit, stomping their feet. Maybe that's just because I have small kids, but that's how I picture it. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the best man is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. I'm going to make an assumption that the majority of us in this room have, and those watching online, have been to a wedding. And all of us can agree that the attention at a wedding is never or should never be on the best man of that particular wedding. The best man is there for encouragement. He's there if he's trustworthy and the groom trusts him to hold the ring. He's there uh, to catch the groom if he happens to pass out before he hits the ground. (laughs) I've been the best man at a wedding, and it is this sort of weird, you're standing there and you're celebrating with the bride and the groom, Uh, But it's sort of an awkward thing, just personally, maybe that's just me, but um, I had somebody joke with me, uh, it wasn't when I was the best man, but the best man's job, if the groom gets cold feet and runs out out of the church or wherever the wedding was being held, it's the best man's job to then step in and take his place. I've never seen that happen, I'm not sure the bride would appreciate that, but... uh, But the wedding is never about the best man, and John was comparing himself to using that analogy. John's response to his disciples, who were comparing comparing themselves to the disciples of Jesus, is the definition of living a life full of contentment. The prayer that John had was that Jesus must increase and that he must decrease more and more. While that is such a simple prayer, it is so profound and sometimes very difficult in our lives to pray. Again, the obvious, we just came out of the Christmas season where we celebrated Jesus' birth. And Christmas and contentment usually don't go hand in hand, especially when you're a child. I remember when I was younger, uh, I don't even know if they have these anymore, but my parents would give my brother and I, I have a brother that's two years older than me, and uh, they would give us the Sears catalog. Do they make those anymore? I'm not even sure. And they would give us the Sears catalog, and we each have a different colored marker and they would instruct us to go through and circle the things that we might like for Christmas. And the interesting thing was, by the time we were done, every year that's, that we did this, every toy that was in that catalog was circled by one of us. Now, I realize that the mentality of having more and more looks different than circling toys in a catalog. But we can easily fall into the mentality of always looking forward to our next purchase or our, the next possession Or thinking if we get that next promotion, then we'll be happy. Or if we can just finish that next project, then life will be good. We'll be content. But the truth is that true contentment is only ever found in Christ. Jesus hadn't really done a whole lot in the life life of John when John prayed this prayer. John simply 
you know, Jesus hadn't gone to the cross. He hadn't provided a way for us to have this very intimate relationship with the Father. Uh, but John realized that he was God, and he simply wanted to abide in him. My prayer for you and I is that as followers of Christ, we can find contentment simply in him and simply in the attributes that he that makes up our God. I, I want to ask three questions, three different areas that uh, I'm trusting that, that you and God are going to look at and examine. Uh, I often say that, that God is really good at what he does, and sometimes we just have to get out of the way. And so I'm going to ask these questions and trust that he's going to do what he does best. The first question is, how content are you with God's calling on your life? John the Baptist, again, he knew his calling. He knew that he was not the Messiah. He was simply the one that was to prepare the way for Christ. And he was fully content with that calling on his life. And despite what the crowds were saying, despite even what his own disciples were saying, he refused to buy into that temptation of what they claimed that he should be. I, I have a little confession, and, and I don't know, maybe some of you can relate with this. I hope so, at least. Uh, but I am a professional excuse maker. Anybody fall in that category with me? Uh, when God calls me to do something, and I'm not comfortable with it, or i might not just might not want to do it, I very easily fall back into this and can quickly come up with about 20 reasons why I shouldn't do those things. I look at other people and I say, he is far more qualified at doing that than I should, that I am, and so he should do that. Or she would do far better at whatever it is that God's called me to do. And every time, God simply reminds me that, that I might be right, they are more qualified, or she might be better at doing whatever it is, big and small. But when God places a call in our life, he very rarely will take that away. Zach Hunter was a fairly normal 12-year-old. It was Black History Month at his school, and he was reading about people, uh, people such as Frederick Douglass and others that were part of helping in slavery. And he had this realization that if he had been around back when slavery was taking place here in America, he would have done something about it. He couldn't have just sat back and allowed people to be mistreated unfairly. And so it, when it dawned on him that slavery was very much a part of our world still today, he took that same mentality and he said, I can't just sit here and do nothing about it. And so Zach started a campaign called Loose Change to Loosen Chains. And this campaign is fairly simple in concept. He would start collecting loose change, and then he would donate it to an organization that would help in slavery. And so he started with himself, and then he asked his friends and family, asked his parents, went to a school, and they started. That's how, it's, that's how it started. This organization has been going strong now for nine years and has helped raise thousands and thousands of dollars all across the United States. Zach has written numerous books. He's appeared on TV. He's been featured in magazines. But what some may not know is that Zach suffered and suffers from extreme anxiety. When he has to be asked to, to, have, to do public speaking, he gets so nervous that he passes out. He gets physically sick. He becomes very paranoid. He hyperventilates. Uh, this actually was so bad that Zach's parents had to remove him from public school because he would get so worked up before school that they decided it's, it, it's just best for him if they... They removed him from school. Well, Zach was 15 when he was scheduled for his first major public speech, speaking engagement. He was supposed to go on after, you might recognize his name, a little guy by the name of David Crowder. And David Crowder was leading a worship set in front of just 15,000 people, and Zach was supposed to go on after him. And you can imagine at age 15 and having the severe anxiety he had, like this was not an easy task. And so David Crowder, in front of his 15,000 people that he was leading in worship, is coming to the end of his set. And Zach realizes he's on next. And a panic attack starts to set in, and he starts to hyperventilate. And he was there with his mom backstage behind the curtain, and his mom said, Zach, if you can't do this, it's okay. Zach had moments of doubt, and he, he almost backed out. But right when he was being... Right when David Crowder ended, he looked at his mom and he said, I have to do it. I have to go. 
if I don't speak up for those that don't have a voice, then no one will. You see, living out the calling God has placed in our lives can at times be very, very uncomfortable. And it can be very difficult. And yet if God has called us to, to something, he will bring us through it and provide contentment along the way. So again, the question is, how content are you this morning with the calling that God has on your life? The second area I want to bring up is how content are you in your relationship with Christ? We just kicked off the new year, and oftentimes we'll hear people say that this year is going to be different, and they're going to read their Bible more, and they're going to pray more, they're going to get more involved in, in church, and, and I'm certainly not knocking any of those things. I would encourage those. You know, the longer I walk with Christ, the more I realize a very, very fundamental truth, and this isn't anything profound, and so most of you will already know this, but uh, his and I's relationship, Christ and I's relationship, we have our ups and we certainly have our downs. We have our mountaintop moments. We would have what I would sort of deem normal everyday living. And then we have those days that really are spent in the valley. I think without even saying this, we would all agree that mountaintop moments are far more enjoyable than those spent in the valley. And yet Philippians 4 calls us to be content in all things. Going back to our friend John the Baptist, he had his mountaintop moments. When Jesus came to him and wanted John to baptize him, can you imagine that moment? John's out there doing his thing, ministering, spreading the gospel, baptizing people, and then the Messiah shows up and says, John, I want you to baptize me. I can imagine he was overly excited, and yet there was a sense of trepidation that must have gone through his body. And John had his days in the valley with his relationship with Christ. John was arrested and began to question whether or not that Jesus really was the person that he claimed to be, to which Jesus quickly assured him that he was indeed the person that he was saying that he was. If you'll allow me to use this illustration, I don't know how good of an illustration this is, but um, it's an illustration nonetheless. But uh, I'm going to use the illustration of, of a married couple. And to some degree, a, uh, someone in a relationship with a significant other to our relationship with Christ. All right, so when we first meet or we first get married to our spouse, there's this sort of lovey dove, roses all over the place where we just can't get enough of our spouse or significant other. We spend as much time with them, and, and uh, we just, every word they say, we're hanging on it. Uh, we're fully in sync. It's not enough to be in the same room as that person. You have to sit right next to them. Maybe I just see this with teenagers. I, I don't know. Uh, but it's not enough to be walking down the street. You have to hold their hand or have their arm beside. Nothing wrong with any of those things, but you're fully in sync. It's a mountaintop moment for you. And then there's that normal everyday living that sort of doesn't always last, uh, those, those mountaintop moments. And you're still in love with them. You're still committed to them. You still want to be married to them. But, you know, it's okay that you're in the same room and you're not sitting right next to them. Or you're walking down the street and it's okay that you're not hanging all over each other. And then there's days that are sort of spent in the valley with a spouse. You still love them. You're still committed to them. You're not looking to get out of, out of the relationship. But there are days that you don't necessarily get, all that, get along with each other all that well. My wife is here this morning, and I'm certainly not here to air my laundry. And hopefully I'm not the only one that experiences those moments where you don't necessarily see eye to eye on things. I've learned in our marriage it usually is something that I have done that needs to be reconciled because uh, I, and this is an honest truth, I'm the immature one in our marriage, and so I usually need to seek her out and, and uh, apologize for something. But our walk with Christ is similar to these stages where we have those moments that we're on the mountaintop with God, and we would say, we are on fire for God. We're going to go out and we're going to we're going to preach to everybody. We're going to spread the gospel to anybody that we know. We have those moments where we still are engaged with God and we love God and we're listening to his voice, but there doesn't really seem to be a whole lot happening. And then there's those days in our relationship with God where we sort of feel like we're walking alone. We've been abandoned. We feel that we've been abandoned. And oftentimes if someone hasn't learned how to be content in Christ and their relationship with him, they begin to question whether or not God is even real anymore. 
when we are in the center of God's will, it doesn't mean that we are always on a mountaintop experience. Finding contentment in the middle of God's will is always right where we need to be. So again, I ask the question, how content are you with the relationship, with your relationship with Christ? If you're on a mountaintop experience right now, I, I celebrate that, uh, but realize that those are sort of far in between. And if you're just going through the motions of everyday living, I pray that you can find contentment there as well. Or if you're in the valley and you're waiting to hear from him, I pray that there's contentment and rest in knowing that you can abide in him regardless of where you are. Finding contentment in God's call can be difficult. Finding contentment in our relationship with Christ can be a challenge sometimes. And in this last area, I, I don't bring up lightly because I know that it's a, it's a difficult thing. I share life with a lot of people and, and uh, my heart breaks knowing that there's some things, sometimes there's nothing we can do. But the question is, how content are you in life's storms? For our friend John the Baptist, he had many life storms. I mentioned earlier that he was arrested, and uh, he was arrested and later beheaded for confronting a king for ungodly living. And I can only imagine as he sat in a prison cell and he knew what was coming, that there were moments that he had great doubt, but through it all, he was focused on Christ and knew that this life storm would eventually pass as well. Life storms look different for all of us, and the, and the list that we could make would be endless, but for some of us here this afternoon, it's, there's a loved one that is sick. For some of us, uh, maybe the the test didn't come back with the results that we thought we were going to get. Some are facing financial crisis and you don't know how you're going to make ends meet. There are marriages that are on the verge of ending. I think we all could say that we have family members or loved ones that don't know the Lord. And we can say that's a life storm as well. So the list can go on and on. I want to offer some encouragement. In Second Corinthians, we read these words and I hope that you can find encouragement in the middle, if you're in the middle of a life storm today, I pray that this is somewhat of an encouraging word to you. Don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I have two fantastic kids. I have an eight-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son. Uh, I love them, and they're great kids. And I, I would deem them to be fairly normal uh, at times. There's times where I wonder, who is the parent of these kids? But uh, for the most part, I, I, I think they're fairly normal, ex with the exception of when a storm happens. When, when they start to see the black sky and the black clouds, they, they just lose their mind. They, I, again, I say that in, in a loving way, but they, they get so worked up that they physically will start to shake and cry uncontrollably. And I don't, I don't know how to console them in those moments. But they get so consumed with the life storm, they forget that eventually that will pass. And that there's hope when that storm does pass. They become so filled with fear. It's easy for us to lose sight of Philippians 4 in the middle of a storm that says, For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. It's interesting that the biggest time of growth in my life, and I would, would assume that for some of you can rate, relate to this, that the biggest time of growth happens in the middle of storms. Usually, we have to wait until that storm has passed until we realize that, but looking back, we, we learn more about ourselves we learn more about those around us. And if we're leaning and trusting on God, we certainly learn more about our Heavenly Father. There's a picture of a family I want to want to show you. This family lived in Turkey in the early 1900s. The gentleman sitting down, the father, his name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel. The mother that's standing, her name is Tarzo. And the infant that is uh, there in the picture, his name is Thomas. This Christian family was known in the area for their wealth and also known for Emmanuel's outspoken nature against the persecution that were taking place where they were at 
uh, for the Christians that were living there at the hands of the Turkey government and certain Muslim extremists. Emmanuel was so outspoken that he eventually had a bounty that was placed on his head. The government wanted him, uh, wanted him captured, dead or alive. And his friends and family tried to convince him that he should flee, and Emmanuel refused until he had two near-death experiences where he was almost captured. And so he thought it would be best to flee the country, come back when things were a little bit more calm. When that decision was made, Tarzo was with their daughter. She was pregnant. Their da his, the daughter's name was Bezzy, and it was a child that Emmanuel never got to meet, never got to see. In the fall of 1915, the town that they were living was raided by some extreme Muslims who brutally ransacked the entire town. Tarzo and her family hid for a couple days, but eventually were found, and they were tortured. But Tarzo was given an opportunity, an opportunity that most were not given, and she had caught the eye of, a, of one of the soldiers. The soldier said, I will spare your life if you will marry me, but in order for that to happen, you have to deny Christ and no longer be a Christ follower. And in that moment of great decision, Tarzo was fully content and committed to her relationship with Christ, and she refused, to which she eventually, uh, her and her mother and uh, quite a few other family members were led to the town, into the middle of the town, and were executed and became martyrs for their faith. Thomas, uh, at the time of this, was about three and a half, and his daughter, I'm sorry, his sister was about two, and when Tarzo was taken away, they uh, separated the two and were raised in a Muslim home by, one of, by some of the soldiers that were there. Through a long series of events, Thomas um, was reunited with his father here in the United States over in Ellis Island in, 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 in New York. And Thomas, learning from the example that his mother gave him and seeing how content she was, regardless of the circumstance, later in life became a Christ follower. And then he became a pastor and evangelist for over 60 years. It had been said by many that Thomas was the kindest and yet most passionate person for Christ. He had a life goal of, of ministering to those of the Muslim faith, which is interesting because he had vivid memories of, of the instance that, that I just shared with you. Thomas grew up and he got married. He had five children of his own, one of which he named Thomas. His son, learning from the example of his father, grew up and he became a pastor and an evangelist as well and has been for the last 60 plus years and he's gone all over the world preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I personally have the privilege of calling that man my grandfather. And he is without a doubt one of my spiritual heroes. The contentment of a lady faced with great turmoil in 1915, which was 100 years next year, had such an impact and still has an impact today. It's easy for us, we're in the middle of a storm where we forget the impact that we can have on others. And so I have again the question, what is God calling you to be content about? What areas in your life do you need to apply that prayer that John the Baptist prayed so many years ago that, that Christ must increase and we must decrease. I have a quote from Oswald Chambers that I'll read as I close. Are you severely troubled right now? Are you afraid and confused by the waves and the turbulence in your life? Does your life seem completely barren to you? I love these next words. Then look up and receive the quiet contentment of the Lord Jesus. Reflecting his peace is proof that you are right with God because you are exhibiting the freedom to turn your mind to him. If you're not right with God, you can never turn your mind anywhere but on yourself. Allowing anything to hide the face of Jesus Christ from you either causes you to become troubled or gives you a false sense of security. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we are so thankful for the contentment, for the peace for the satisfaction that you offer to our lives. And I pray, Lord, that in my life, in these areas, 
And for those that are here this morning and watching online, whether it's con finding contentment in your call and the big things and the small things, or it's contentment in a relationship with you wherever we are in those stages, or if it's contentment in a storm, I pray that we can lean on you fully and trust that it's going to be you that's glorified in our lives. Thank you for this opportunity this morning to worship you, and we pray that you're glorified. Amen. As we sing this closing song, and just ask that you would um, use this time to reflect, to pray, to let the Holy Spirit lead. If you want to come to the altar, um, it's open. But let's just let the, the Lord lead us right now. Can't 